Hello Broward Churches, are you ready to love South Florida? This fall is our chance to unite together, hundreds of churches strong, to show the love of Jesus to our community. The city needs to see us coming together as one. All different denominations and all different places. It's time for us to come together. Working together to help those that are in need. I'm so incredibly excited to partner together with you guys. United for the purpose of glorifying Christ. So together, let's unite across the city to love, give, and serve our community. Let's watch God change hearts and lives in a way that transforms South Florida for all eternity. It's a great blessing and honor to be with you today at this church. I've heard about you for a long time. Brian tells me all the wonderful things that you folks are doing and how great you are. And I was supposed to be with you before, but my wife, who is an adult cystic fibrosis patient, had a medical emergency, and I had to cancel on that occasion. But I'm glad that on this occasion, she's doing well, and I'm able to be with you today. I've enjoyed yesterday and today, and uh, it's a thrill to see what God is doing uh, through you as a church, not only here, but around the world in your global outreach and your world mission program. If you want to open your Bibles today, you can do that as we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll read a verse there to get started. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 is a unique chapter. It's a chapter that talks about giving, and I know that as pastor has already said, that giving is not always the most popular topic, and uh, I told Brian yesterday, when, like he says, we've known each other for 30 years, I said, thanks a lot. You gave me the topic where people turn you off. It's the one about giving, and it's the one about money. I said, you could have given me one of the other topics, but no, you gave me that one. But you know, money and giving in the Bible, it's not bad. It's not a curse. It's not there to hinder us. It's not there to hurt us. What God has to say about giving and money and finances in the Bible is for our benefit, It's God wants to bless us, and God wants to use us to reach the world. The Bible teaches us some wonderful things about what God does for us. Everything God has given us, he's done it because he has a reason and a purpose. Uh, We, first of all, thank him for the salvation, the forgiveness of sin, the eternal life God has given us. If you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never done that, you can have eternal life because God offers it to you. Then on top of all that, everything God gives us, our talents, our abilities, our spiritual gifts, the job you have, the good health you have, if you have that, and if you have a physical affliction, I've learned in my wife's illness that God has a purpose in that also. There's something he wants to do for his glory and honor. The home God's given you, the family God has given you, the job he's given you, the talent, everything he's given you, the resources he's given you, he gives it to you for a reason. And he also gives you and I the responsibility of administrating those resources properly. And in that process, he gives us the privilege of taking what he has given us and turning right back around and investing some of that in his great work. You think about that. That is a privilege. God isn't broke. God's not bankrupt. He doesn't have to have your dollar, but what he wants to do is bless you. And he says, you know, I've got a great work going on. And if you'd like to give, if you'd like to participate, you're going to be blessed beyond measure. And that's what he does. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, there's a phenomenal thing going on. And let me read the verse and then we'll tell you what's happening here. Okay. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God and That word grace is going to be the key verse throughout this passage. We want you to know about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. The grace of God is a wonderful thing when it comes to giving. Yesterday, I had the opportunity of walking into your church auditorium for the first time, and and I was able to see you in action. None of these chairs were here. You had tables set up and a lot of people working and there's just, it was a neat thing to see what God was doing through you as you participated in a ministry of giving to someone else, people that have a need. I've heard about also, last week it was, you gave an offering of almost $23,000 to go to Haiti and help out in the ministry and the need there. And so God will bless you for that. In verse 1, we find the Apostle Paul writing to this church of Corinth. 
Now, my wife tells me all the time, Roy, she says, when you preach, you're always pointing at things. And I'll use things as a point of reference, all right? So you bear with me today. Over here is going to be the church of Corinth. So I'm going to let you folks be Corinth, all right? Paul is writing his second letter that he writes to the church of Corinth. But he's using, as an illustration, the churches of Macedonia, and specifically the church of Philippi. And so this point of reference is going to be my church of Philippi. And you folks are unchurched, all right? So we need to reach you, all right? That's why we're having, Brother Mike, we need to reach you with the gospel, amen? But no, he's already been reached, and praise God for his wonderful testimony. So Corinth and Philippi. So if I point in these directions, that's what you represent. He's writing to the church of Corinth, and Paul says this, I want you to know, church of Corinth, about the grace of God in the churches of Macedonia, and particularly that church of Philippi. Now, there was one thing that unified them, and that was their love and devotion for the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the things I like about being in multi-ethnic churches such as yours, I preached a few moments ago in the Spanish church, now I'm here with you. I love the diversity that's reflected in the body of Christ. And thank the Lord that you are a diverse church. There's different races, different nationalities, different language groups, different cultural groups, different generations that are represented here, and that is fantastic. But beyond that, a local church also has its personality, characteristic, and temperament, and and, and what identifies it. And so he says to this church of Corinth, he says, I want you to know about the grace of God that has been bestowed over here on the churches of Macedonia. Now, the church of Corinth was in the city of Corinth, and the city of Corinth was a city of wealth and influence. It was a crossroads of, um, of merchant routes that took place in those days, and because of the commerce that took place in this crossroads. Some merchants established their businesses here in the city. The city grew. It was a city of affluence. There was economy. There was money. And so the church of Corinth had money. So all of you folks representing Corinth up here, you're extremely wealthy. Amen? And I I hope you can identify with that. (laughs) Now, the church of Philippi is in a different ballgame, so if you're not there with the folks of Corinth, you can come sit over here. (laughs) The church of Philippi was in a different ballgame altogether, as we're going to see in just a moment. They didn't have a lot, but they did a lot. And so this is the church of Philippi, all right? You represent the poor folks, amen? Now, if you need to adjust your seating and walk over here to Corinth, we'll all know that you have a lot of money, amen? And then I'd like to be your friend after church. (laughs) So here's these two churches that Paul is writing about. And he begins to give some traits of the church of Philippi. And I want to have you know one thing, that the church Philippi was, first of all, a result of Paul and Silas' missionary outreach. It had been started through their missionary ministry. But then, as that church matured and grew, they became extremely involved in Paul's ministry. In fact, there was a point when Paul writes them in the book of Philippians, he said, there was a point in my ministry when you, the church of Philippi, were the only one participating with me in my evangelistic and missionary outreach. So this was a church that was started by the missionary, but also participated in the missionary's great activity. They had a global vision. They had a passion for reaching the world with Christ. And so Paul writes to the church that had a lot about the church that didn't have much, but he writes to them about the grace of God, what it had done, and he gives some characteristics. So if you're following along in your notes, the very first thing we find that characterizes this church in verse 2 was that this was a church that gave out of sacrifice. Look at verse 2. For in a severe test of affliction, this was a church that knew what affliction and therefore sacrifice was all about. In fact, the church of Philippi was started through great affliction or adversity. Acts chapter 16 gives the beginning of this fabulous church. It was started when Paul and Silas were ministering, and not because of any wrong they had done, but they were then taken prisoner. There was adversity. There was opposition. They were taken prisoners. They were beaten within an inch of their life and cast into prison. You've heard the famous story before, maybe in messages by your pastor, or you've read Acts chapter 16. It's a phenomenal chapter in the book of Acts. They had been ministering, and now they are beaten and cast into prison. They're not criminals. They've done nothing wrong. They've just been serving God. But, oh, there's always the opposition to God's work. Even as we seek to reach the world in this mission conference, there's going to be satanic opposition 
Satan would love to hinder us from a church, as a church, from participating in global evangelism. Satan would like to hinder you so that you don't share the message of salvation, so that your testimony is ineffective in reaching others. He opposes the work that we, God wants us to do. And so they had been cast into prison and in prison that night. Instead of writing a letter, dear mission agency, we quit. <laughs> they almost beat us to death today. We don't like this part of the job. We quit. Instead of doing that, the Bible tells us that, man, at midnight, they're singing praises to God. Now, how many people do that? <laughs> they're just singing praises to God, and uh, God does a miracle. The prison doors are open. Prisoners begin to run, and they come face to face with the man responsible for their beating just a little earlier. What would you do? Would you let a vengeful spirit manipulate you and control you at that moment? The Bible story tells us that the man in charge of the prison took out a sword knowing full well the penalty that the Roman government would impose upon him for this escape of prisoners. He takes out his sword and he's about to commit suicide. What would you do if he was the man responsible for almost beating you to death? Would you go over there and say, hey, don't do that. Give me the sword and I'll do it for you. <laughs> I'll take your life. You almost killed me earlier. Let me behead you. No, he doesn't do that. Paul leaves that man to Jesus Christ. That's what the grace of God does. Amen. Amen. And so Paul leads that man to the Lord. And the Bible tells us in a phenomenal story that that night they go to this man's house. His entire family is saved. They're baptized. By the way, it was a beautiful thing to see this family up here a while ago because of that child. That was a great thing. That was good. That blessed my heart. <laughs> so this church was born in the midst of affliction, persecution, beatings, and the church began to prosper and grow. Paul writes later on a chapter to that, a book to that church, the book of Philippians, short book, but the theme of the book of Philippians is rejoicing. This is a church born in affliction. And they experienced ongoing opposition and adversity and affliction. And so their participation in global evangelism was because of sacrifice. Or I turn around to point and it's not up there. It'll be up there, I guess, a moment ago it was there. Uh, okay, now I can point. Okay, there it is. I told you, my wife tells me, Roy, you point at everything. So there it is. You see, this does away with the idea or the notion or the, uh, that we only give if things are going good in life. I can give if God's really blessing and there's no sorrow or problems in my life. Everything's just going hunky-dory, as we say in the South. By the way, my accent probably has betrayed me. I live in Ringgold, Georgia. All right? You probably didn't know that, but I'll tell you now. And over there, we say hunky-dory. That means everything's just fine. But you know, the Bible teaches us that here was a church that gave in global evangelism, Paul's missionary outreach, even through great sacrifice. I don't know what you're going through in life, and you don't know what I'm going through in life right now. And you may be facing great difficulties, and maybe there's a great deal of sacrifice going on in your life. But God still will, by his grace, enable us to do what seems to be impossible. Amen? And so this church gave through sacrifice. Another characteristic of the church is also found in verse 2, and it's the word joy, if you want to put that down there. For in a severe test of affliction, the next phrase, some, uh, next phrase he says something that seems to be an oxymoron, their abundance of joy. What in the world is going on here? First of all, we have sacrifice and affliction, and the very next phrase in the verse tells us that they just had an abundance, not a little bit, an abundance of joy. I'm going to tell you right now that given to world missions, given to the folks in Haiti, given to your missionaries that go around this globe can be a thing that brings joy into the church and into your personal life. Participating in world missions is not there to hinder or hurt you, as I said at the beginning. It's there to bless us. We have the privilege. You don't have to give to missions. You get to give to missions. Amen? You have the privilege of participating. And it seems like an oxymoron that this church that faced adversity, opposition, and great sacrifice also demonstrate great joy. That's what happens when we let God's grace work in our life. There's a third thing we find. Look also in verse 2. There's a 
third characteristic. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, and then look at this, their extreme poverty. They were poor. They were in extreme poverty. They were so poor that the poor people called them poor. Amen? <laughs> I mean, they just were in extreme poverty. It doesn't make sense that they could give while they gave, but they did. And the Bible says that it overflowed, what? In a wealth of generosity on their part. So Paul is writing to these folks over here, the wealthy people that sit over here, the church of Corinth, and he says, you have all kinds of things you've been blessed with. But I just need to tell you that there's a little church over here in the midst of great sacrifice and adversity and affliction have so much joy because they've learned to give generously to God, to God. Isn't that something? The poor, afflicted people were doing something that this church that was blessed with abundance didn't know what. They, they had not experienced that yet. They just learned to be generous. Generosity can be different things for different people depending upon where you are in life, your economic status. Giving is one thing. Generous giving is something else. And then sacrificial giving can be something else. I've had the privilege of growing up on the mission field. My dad is 82, and it was 51 years ago that we went to the mission field. I was just a kid, and I grew up on the mission field, came back to the States, went to Bible college, got married. My wife and I went back to the mission field, and, and we've been involved in missions since 1979, and, and we've enjoyed it. One of the things that I've learned and I've been blessed with and challenged by in my ministry in life is seeing those that don't have a lot let God's grace work in their life so that they do a lot. I had the opportunity of working in the Yucatan Peninsula for many years. In fact, I'm going back just three weeks from now, and I'll be involved in ministry there again. We had the opportunity of ministering in a city of Merida, which has about a million people today. They have just about all the conveniences we have. And within 20 minutes, we could be in villages where people still lived in mud huts and dirt floors, and it was just a different world 20, 25 minutes away. And I had the privilege of ministering in both settings. One of the greatest lessons I was ever taught one day was in a hut of a little mestiza from descendant of the Maya Indians in a hut that was not any wider than those shoe boxes right here to about right here. And no longer from that monitor to where I'm standing right here. And she lived there with her children. Dirt for a floor, thatch for a roof, mud walls. Slept in these grass hammocks made out of this rough grass fiber. She didn't have anything. And I'd gone there as the missionary to pray with her and to offer encouragement as we would go around visiting the people. And I was in her house. And we prayed, and we talked, we read the scriptures together, and then she said, Hermano Roy, I want to give you something. She didn't have a lot, but she had some mangoes, and she had some bananas, had some tropical fruit, and so she prepared a little gift for me. Boy, I stood there that day, and I looked at that woman in her poverty, and I saw those children around, and I knew she didn't have much, and she offered me that gift, and I said, Hermano I said, I appreciate your generosity, but you don't need to do that. That, that. That's for your children. You need that. And she said, oh, no. She said, hermano Roy, I want you to have that. And I told her again. I said, no, I, I cannot take that. And she looked at me, and she said, are you going to rob me of a blessing? She said, hermano Roy, I don't have a whole lot. I'm trying to give you something that I do have, and I need you to take this. Will you rob me of a blessing? That was the hardest gift I've ever taken in my life. I walked away that day to my pickup truck, and I didn't dare look back at her because of the tears streaming down my face, and I was carrying that. And I knew her children could have used that. Mangoes and bananas. But it was a generous offering on her part. I'm not worried or concerned about how much money you have and how many resources you have. The thing today is, have we learned to be generous with God? After all, he was generous with us. Can we give generously? What if we all gave generously? The reason why this church that was living through sacrificial times and times of adversity could give joy, joyfully and with generosity, the reason they could do that is found in verse 5. I want you to notice the next thing in our outline. Look at verse 
5. How did they give? Well, the Bible says, and this not as we expected. They didn't give according to our expectations. And Paul knew the status of the church. You could do this little mental calculation. Here's the church. Okay, I know where everybody is in life. I know where they are, and so this is their potential. But Paul said they didn't do it that way. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. That fourth thing that characterizes this church, that enabled them to give generously, abundantly, and can enable us to do more than people would ever expect of us, is when we first of all commit ourselves to God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your lives a living sacrifice to him. That's what God wants. We worry about giving this or giving the contents of that to somebody. But you know, when we've given our lives to God, when we've put our lives on the altar, he's already got that then, doesn't he? My job is to say, God, you gave for me. You saved me. Now I want to give my life to you. And if I do that, then he already has my wallet. He has everything, my family, my home, my job, my career, my plans, my dreams, my visions, my future, everything I have, I give it to God. And then God can say, I'll take that. Yes, we can use that. And it's not a problem because I've given myself to God. That's what this church in Philippi did. That's why they, as difficult as things were, were able to give in a way this church still hadn't experienced because they had given themselves totally to God. We're talking today about giving money, but I'm going to tell you something else that goes beyond this church giving their money is when you begin to give your church members. Pastor's been telling me for the last couple of days while I've been here, this is what this brother does, this is what this family does, this is what this sister does, this is what this lady does, this is what these young people do, and he's telling me about you, and I'm thinking, yeah, man, we could use some of those people on the mission field. <laughs> now, I didn't tell him that, <laughs> but I'm saying, hey, that's good, Brian. I'm taking note of all you folks. I'm taking inventory. He's also told me about some of you. I said, nah, I don't think I'll take them. <laughs> but I've been thinking, oh, man, they'd be great on the mission field. Did you know that that's one of the greatest blessings a church will experience is not only when you give your financial resources to God for world evangelism, but God reaches down and he says, I want this man, I want this lady, I want this couple, I want this family, and they are so useful. God doesn't call the people that are just sitting on the pews, not involved. God calls your best people, the ones that are involved. And oh, how we need to be generous in giving our people to the Lord, and, and that's what we see will take place if we do that, give ourselves to God, and he can use us in global evangelism. So there was the matter of commitment. There's a fifth thing that characterized this church, and we drop down to verse 7 to see this. But as you excel in everything. Now, this church of Corinth did excel in some things. They excelled in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all earnestness. And then he says, and in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. And that matter of love is the fifth characteristic of this church. Now, that phrase, in our love for you, can be translated various ways. Another translation says, in the love that we kindled in you. And then another translation says, and in your love for us or to us. In other words, what he's saying right here is this was a love that was demonstrated in a reciprocal fashion. Paul and his missionary companion had gone there. They'd seen this great church established because they loved these people. And now this church loved them. And because of this great motivator of love, they were able to do great things together. They had this partnership in missions. Love is one of the greatest motivating tools this world has ever seen. It's through love and because of love that we can do things that would seem absolutely impossible. My wife and I have been married 39 years, Lord willing, next year uh, in August. We will celebrate 40 years of marriage together. 
And just like anybody else, another, you know, there are times when we've had a few disagreements. And there are times when, well, there have been many times when I've been wrong. <laughs> My wife doesn't have to apologize very often. But boy, I've had to say I'm sorry so many times. I've had to eat crow so many times. <laughs> I'm amazed that she still loves me, but she does. We stay together because we love. When I married my wife, I didn't know she had cystic fibrosis. If you know anything about the disease, it's a genetic disease. She was born with it. But um, uh, it, she had a strain of it, a mutation of it, that was not, it, it didn't manifest itself until she was an adult. We went to the mission field not knowing she had cystic fibrosis. And eventually she became so critically ill, we brought her back for some studies. And eventually in her 30s found out that she had cystic fibrosis. That's affected the rest of my life and my ministry. Things I can do and things I can't do. It presents me with some challenges. I've had to say no to some seemingly great opportunities to do things. And, but I love my wife. And there was a day I stood in front of a church and I committed to God and those witnesses that were present that I would love her for better or for worse. Remember that, guys? And the good things and the bad things in Spanish, we say, en las buenas y en las malas. And so, no matter what the illness has done, we still love each other, and there's a commitment factor there that's very important. It's just very important. Because that love is a motivating factor. I've been blessed to be with your pastor and family since Friday, since I've been here. And I remember when Amber was born in Mexico City. We rejoiced in the home office of the mission agency at the news of the missionaries on the field. They've got another child. Sometime later, the Burke holders discovered that Amber would not have a normal childhood. And you know Amber now better than I do. She's a sweet child, a precious young lady. You know, I've seen a love in mom and dad this weekend once again that reminds me of their commitment to her. And that's what love does. Love is the motivating tool that motivates us to do things that otherwise we would never do. And when it comes to reaching the world, those that need Jesus, love is the tool that will motivate you to reach out to those who have cultural habits so different from us that it's not just different, sometimes it's distasteful. But love motivates us to share the gospel with them. Love will motivate us to share the gospel with those who are our enemies. Four weeks ago, or three weeks ago, I'm sorry, on this Sunday, three weeks ago, I sat in a commissioning service for a family that's going to the mission field with our organization, and they're going over to the Middle East to deal with people and share Christ with people that they don't really like us. <laughs> that culture over there, they are opposed to us politically, militarily, and in so many other ways. But we go over there with the gospel. Why? Because we love God and we love souls. And love for God will motivate you, enable you to give when nothing else in this world would motivate you to give to God's work. What if we all gave out of love? Boy, it would be a different thing, wouldn't it? And so we let love be the motivating tool. And then there's a sixth thing that I share with you today, and I want you to drop all the way down to verse 9. In verse 9, we find the verse that explains and defines grace to us. And grace is the key thing here. Once again, we find it in verse 1. We find it in verse 6, we find the word grace in verse 7, and now in verse 9, and this is what the Bible says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. And this verse wonderfully describes grace, because this church of Philippi, facing adversity, in extreme poverty, gave sacrificially, yet joyfully and generously, not only because they committed themselves to God, not only because of love, but because the grace of God had been demonstrated in their lives. The grace of God is experienced two ways by the believer and the Christian. We experience the grace of God for salvation, and then we experience the grace of God for our Christian walk and how we live. 
And Paul explains the grace. He said, the grace of God is this. The grace of our Lord that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. The Son of God, the creator of this world, second person of the Trinity, God himself, in heaven with God the Father, one day stepped over the balcony of heaven and came to this world that he himself had created, lived in a perfect environment, no sin in heaven, but the grace of God is that he that was rich became poor. He came to this world. He was born in a manger in a place that was barely fit for animals. He lived in the home of a carpenter. And while some followed him, others rejected him. They mocked him. They ridiculed him. And there came that terrible day that when he was taken and crucified, he that was rich became poor so that we, says verse 9, who were poor, spiritually speaking, we were all poor. Every one of us were spiritually bankrupt. We could not put together enough works or good deeds to buy five seconds in heaven. So we were spiritually bankrupt. He that was rich became poor so that we who were poor might be made rich. And so today I'm a rich man. No, not because of what I've gotten there. Don't think that you can mug me outside and take what's up here and get to it. That's, I'm not rich because of what's in there. I'm wealthy because of what Jesus Christ did for me. He gave me the forgiveness of my sins. He gave me peace that the world cannot take away. And he saved me, and he's promised me eternal life, eternal life. One day I'm going to trade in that 16-year-old Grand Marquis I drive <laughs> and walk on streets of gold, amen? In fact, I won't need a car up there, amen? <laughs> See, I'm wealthy in Jesus Christ. He was rich. He became poor. That's grace. So that I, who was poor, could be wealthy that's the grace of God. And Paul is saying here to this church of Corinth, I, I, I would like to see you guys experience what this church, not only have they been saved by the grace of God, now they are living by grace. And grace has motivated this group of people in extreme poverty to give generously and abundantly to the work God's called us to do. So when your pastor talks to you about mission giving in this church and, oh, no, it's money once again, he's not trying to hinder you. He's not trying to reach his hands into your pocket and get something you have. That's not it. He's just explaining to you, here's a Bible concept, a scriptural concept, a spiritual concept that God wants us to entrust with him some of the resources that he's given us, and thereby he'll not only reach the lost around the world, but he wants to bless us given by grace. Grace is a wonderful thing. Grace is the thing that will take the life of the hell-bound, hell-deserving sinner and transform that life and make a beautiful person out of that. that that's what you are doing when we have a mission program at Hollywood Community Church and we give to missionaries around the world. We're letting the grace of God come and touch the life of a sinner and transform that life into something beautiful. For those of us who have been involved in evangelism We've seen that. If you've ever led people to Christ, you've been able to see the grace of God in action. We've been able to see it in missions. But one of the neatest stories in my life that God has blessed me with and experiencing the grace of God is I saw it in the life of a young man, John. When John was a boy, John's parents were, um, they were just, you know, they were the stars in the high school where John's parents went uh, John's dad, big old man, 6'5". He was a star on the football field. He was a star on the basketball court. And, and John's mom, she was cheerleader, beautiful, attractive girl. And they got married right out of high school. Had two boys right away. And then things kind of went south. John's father became addicted to alcohol and drugs. And they so possessed him that it changed his personality and he became abusive to his wife and to his family, and eventually this couple that seemingly at one stage of life had it all, lost it all almost. And a divorce took place. The family was split, and John and his brother were caught in this split relationship. 
And as the arrangements was that John's father would take him on certain times, uh, many times John and his brother was with their dad, but he was still under the influence of the drugs and the alcohol, and he would get them and take them, and it would be a terrible circumstance and situation. There were times when John's brother, who was 12, would have to drive him home because John's father would go to the bar, lock the boys in the pickup, go in, and hours later come out so drunk he couldn't even drive, and so John's brother was 12, would drive the pickup home, and they would put their dad in the bed, and then he would get them on Christmas time. While others were eating Christmas meals, John would have to climb up on the cabinet and get bread and peanut butter, and his Christmas meal was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He spent more than one Christmas doing that. And then the grace of God reached down and touched his father. And that drug addict, alcoholic man, slave to the vices of this world, was transformed by the grace of God. Grew in the Lord and became a director of a rescue mission one of the most successful rescue mission operators I've ever seen because he could identify with the people. By the way, that's what Jesus did with us. The incarnate Son of Man identified with us in our infirmities. John's father passed away this year after a bout with cancer, but left a legacy of how a life can be transformed by the grace of God. John continued to grow and As he became older, he flirted with afflictions for a while. And then the grace of God touched his life as a college student. Transformed his life. God not only saved him, but through the grace of God, God turned around and called him to preach and to serve him. He goes to seminary, prepared himself in seminary. One day, that young man sat in my living room and asked me if he could marry my oldest daughter. And I said, yes. They live live in North Florida. They're part of a church. He's not the pastor, but he has an important ministry in the church. It's a church that was started 12 years ago in a living room, and today it's a church of 2,000 that reach out to the students of FSU in Tallahassee. And John, whose life was touched by the grace of God, is in charge of the recovery program there. And he and my daughter every week on a weekly basis deal with young couples and young people whose lives have been devastated by sin. That's what the grace of God does. And Paul was saying to the church of Corinth, he said, this is what the grace of God is about. God reaching down and touching our lives and changing us and then God motivating us as believers to reach out to those who are undesirable and touch their lives. That's what the grace of God does. And my desire is, my prayer is that you as a church will continue because you're already involved in world missions, but you will continue to reach out to the world because of the grace of God. What if we give by grace? Now, I know there's one more point on that message, so I'm going to do something. I'm going to leave that blank. So I'm leaving myself open to an invitation to come back and finish. Amen. (laughs) That's how I do it. So, and then again, after today, you may say, no, we don't want to hear from him anymore. (laughs) The grace of God, what a wonderful thing it is. The grace of God is, is what pulled you in here. Amen. Some of you could give up and give the same testimony. You could get up and give the same testimonies I've just given about the grace of God. Let's let the grace of God take us to reach the world. Father, we do thank you for your grace and the fact that you loved us when we were unlovable, when we were undesirable. You sent your son to die for us, and he paid the price for my sins, our sins. And by your grace, you've saved us. Help us to live by grace. Help us to give by grace. For those who do not know you today, may they let your grace touch their lives today, I pray in Jesus' name.